I'm leaving meeting. Got it. No, don't please don't leave the meeting. Got it. We've started. Hello. Are we, are we live? We are live. Most of us are live. So a big, huge welcome to Hanoch Piven. Thank you. Hi, Mel. How are you, my friend of say, I'm, 17 years? I'm very well. So like you stole my first line, which was the disclosure that we uh, know each other. Uh, I consider myself a friend of yours, and I'm also a big fan of yours, not only because you are a world-famous artist, uh, but because you are a mensch, you're a wonderful person, uh, you invest most of your time in education, and uh, rather than most people who invent something and then hide it from everybody else, uh, you invented something global, and then you share with other people exactly how to copy what you're doing. What uh, there is some truth to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, but so then they, 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 they but then they always tell me we thought it was so easy, and now we see how great you are because we uh, cannot do it the way you do it. You know, uh -huh. but so, uh, you know, I've been uh, doing it for for thirty something years, so it's easy. so it, it, it's it's altruism for fun and profit. Exactly, but I have to introduce the show. So I'm Mel Rosenberg, and I am the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And I am here with a wonderful, spectacular guest, Hanoch Piven, who is celebrating a brand new children's book. It's not enough you're a world famous, a um, dream big and laugh often, and more great advice from the Bible, Hanoch Piven and Shira Hech Koller. Yes. So this book just came out two months ago. Yeah, it's uh, it's really new. It came out in, uh, of course, in United States, and um, it um, it will be published in Hebrew next year uh, by Otsad Shoken by Shoken Books here. Um, and um, what do you want to know about the book? I'll, I'll answer. No, I, 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 I want to know. It's not enough that your um, iconoclastic work. Um, your uh, collage artistry, your portraits have appeared in Time magazine on the cover of Newsweek and so many other a, um, a important magazines. You had to mosey into children's literature too. You couldn't leave something tiny for other people. You also had to become a world famous children's writer. Well, um, okay, for starters, my first book for children came was published in 2001 so way before i think you published a, a, a book for children right uh, no I mean, no it's, no it's, but okay. it, 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 the program okay, is about but the, me though okay I, no no I, but I, the I, point the point the point i'm trying to make is that it's not a new thing for me i've been doing it for for i would say you know seven, eight years into my career. And, and it was a very natural progress because in a way, um, it's funny because, you know, I come from wanting to be a caricature artist. You can see some of my portraits behind me. Uh, there is Madonna, there is Keith Richard, there is Sarah Netanyahu, the wife of uh, Israeli prime minister. Um, my DNA was of a caricature artist wanting to um, make faces, draw faces. Um, but um, I developed into that, um, into the idea of using objects, everyday objects, because I cannot draw very well, as I've mentioned to you many times. And, um, and, it, and I discovered the very playful way to create. <laughs> So um, for the first six, seven years of my career, my work was published in, in serious mag in magazines, in Time, Newsweek, in Israel, Aretz. And people were telling me at the beginning, well, your work should be for children. And I was like, no way. I'm a serious artist. My work is for adults. And, um, you know, the children will not get the, the, the subtleties of the, of the meaning of the objects. And then they will tell me, well, it doesn't matter if a kid sees a, 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 a man with a banana nose. So even if they don't know it is Woody Allen, 
they would laugh at the idea that there is a banana nose. So, so I failed to see at the beginning how much my work was really for children. Um, so once I realized that, I, I embraced it. And, um, and this is, I think, my eighth or ninth or tenth book in, that comes out in the United States. Um, as, for, as far as I'm counting, it's number eight, but we, we might be wrong. Okay, yeah, I mean, I had the perfect purple feather and uh, the scary show of Joe and Mo, Mo and Joe. And uh, what I mean, the more the, the most successful books that I had were the ones that were somewhat related to education, to the school system. What presidents are made of, uh, a book about American presidents was immediately um, taken by libraries, by, by school teachers, by elementary school teachers. Um, and, and it became a quite a successful book, uh, which gave me for, for a long time uh, royalties. Um, and then the surprising other book, um, and, and I have to say that first book was uh, by Ateneum um, Simon & Schuster. Uh, edited by um, it, edited by uh, Annie Kelly, who was a young editor at the time, um, and um, and eventually she moved to Random House to Schwartz and Wade Books, and they she offered me to do a book together, and we came up. She really pushed it. Uh, we came up with a book called "My Dog Is as Smelly as Dirty Socks," and that book became really, that book is still selling very well. Why? Because the whole book is made um, with the idea, my, uh, my dog is as smelly as, uh, my mother is as soft as, uh, as uh, wool, as sweet as a cookie, as smart as a light bulb. And teachers in elementary school love this book because they use it to teach similes and metaphors for children in early writing. So if there is something that I learned over the years is that uh, a book that has some correspondence, some relevance to the, um, to the school studies um, is very, has a big chance to be, uh, to be re well received and to sell well if it can serve a function. Okay, let's so uh, but we're going to celebrate first of all your new book. Okay. Um open it up, show us a picture. Yeah, so 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 this was a way of um may, can, could I share my screen and uh, of, of, we, of course you can. Okay. It's, it's your um, program, you can do anything. Okay. So, lots so, lots yeah, of people so, lots of people are listening. So I will just say uh run no, out we, we, and, yeah, and I, run I out will and buy this book. Yeah, so, so the book really, I, I think it's connected in a way to what I was just talking about education, because um, the book is in a way a, 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 an, an entry point for kids to the Bible stories and the place for kids to, uh, and adults and their grandparents, their parents, to, to, to start talking about the Bible. So um, now it is obviously relevant. It, it is the Old Testament. And, um, and, and in a way, if I describe the cover on the, on the cover, you see Noah, Noah on the Noah Ark. Ark you see the, the animals, of course. And, um, and Noah's head is a mitten. Um, and his eye is a water faucet, a water, water faucet, you call it? Yeah. yeah. So, and his mouth is an umbrella. So there are lots of co connotations to water. Um, and his beard is a scrubbing, um, like a metal scrubbing um, kitchen sponge. So it was connected with water, with cleaning. But um, if you look at his arms, he has the uh, kid floaters on his arms. And, um, and for me, this is symbolic because it is the way of bringing those big names into the kids' world by making them those uh, celebrated characters from the Bible by putting um, very, first of all, by making them out of toys, household elements, 
it brings them down to, in a way, to our level, to our life. Um, but also the idea that Noah has uh, like a kid floaters on his arm, um, really, I think it's a way to, to, for the kid to relate to it. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a kid, a kid with a pair of animals, of course. Yes, 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 yes. And um, so the way um, the way this book developed was um, okay. Let, let 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 me tell you something else about my work. I, I create collages, and um, you know I know that you talk a lot about creativity, and 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 of course there is the element of serendipity and of chance and of happy accidents. That and and in Yiddish it's called the sure um, that that happen somehow and you're not expecting them. And I think when you when you create collages and when you're create a creator in general, you are constantly looking for those happy accidents and you increase the chances that they will come and you are ready to see them. You are aware. You you are you are present. You are watching. You are paying attention you are putting you are there so um so this book really happened because of a happy accident um five years ago i was um invited to come and give workshops in a in a jewish camp in the poconos in pennsylvania uh in a modern orthodox camp so you know, I said, fine, I, I went there and, you know, I gave the workshops for three days and it, uh, with kids that uh, obviously everybody was religious. Uh, I wore a cap uh, for three days, my, my jogging cap. Um, and on the last workshop, I gave a workshop for adults, for teachers. And this woman comes to me, Shira a scholar, and she says, I've been following you for years. I'm your fan. Um, let's do a book together about the Bible. And I said, ho, 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 I know, no, you know, since high school, I haven't done any, you know, I haven't studied anything about the Bible. But um, she said, I'll teach you. Let's study the Bible together. And we started to read some stories. And, um, and then I said, okay, but, you know, I, I don't really subscribe to the whole idea of, uh, you know, God, uh, I actually don't really like the way God is portrayed in the Bible. You know, he's not a very positive, uh, you know, um, depiction of him. And she said, you know, let's find what's in the Bible is relevant to you. And I said, OK, let's see how we can connect the Bible to educational stories, to stories that kids can relate to nowadays. So I asked her, OK, let's see. For example, Eve, what is the essence of the Eve story? Because, you know, traditionally we talk about the story of Eve as the story of temptation, of sin, of, um, of something negative. You know, um, Eve failed in the test. But, and she said, well, you know what? You could also say that the story of Eve is the story of curiosity, of wanting to know. And I said, you know what? And this kind of really was the key that opened the door for me to enter into these stories and to say, well, the Jewish people have been um, doing parshanut, have been um, doing um, their own interpretation of those stories forever. Why can't I do it? Why can't Shira and I do it as well? You know, and find there this still the values that are relevant to us. And through us, they might be relevant to other people as well. So it became eventually a story of advice. If we were, if the kid were to meet those Bible characters, what advice would they give, give them? So Eve might tell you to be curious and uh, Noah, might tell you, might advise the kid to be good, be a good person, behave in a good way. And Abraham, which is a favorite of mine because of his advice, is trust the journey. It's sort of a Dr. Seuss 
quote if you go, if you go places you'll discover you'll you know you, you'll discover new things but um abram was told to go on a journey without a clear destiny and he walked and walked and walked through hall throughout the whole of the middle east and more uh and eventually after making a big many 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 rounds he arrived to the promised land so i as a creator i can identify very much to this story of going on a journey and trusting it not knowing where it will take you um and trusting it so uh, Hanoch, i wanted to ask you here in this uh, picture yeah. <laughs> the people who are listening are just going to have to go out and buy the book i'm uh, repeating it's called dream big uh, laugh often and uh it's out and available everywhere in the western world um especially in the bible belt no, i'm joking yeah. Um, no, I'm and, 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 <laughs> yeah and 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 here you have like a, a picture of the globe made out of jigsaw a piece of puzzles right right it, it's abram it's uh, it's abram and he is going to uh a place that is still doesn't have shape so it's made out of jigsaw puzzle mm -hmm. um and his, but, his body his body is a um is the um collector's it's, item it's a uh it's, it's a, an envelope uh, it's a letter yeah. postcard envelope. yeah with yeah and and in a way and and he's carrying um a suitcase mm -hmm. with um travelers stickers you know like uh yeah. i've been to london i've been to paris and i've been um, I, i've been to urkazdim yeah to urkazdim exactly and there is a camel uh carrying a container um you you know so there is nonsense in my work i i, I use the nonsense for the kids to laugh, to discover, to say, well, this doesn't make sense that uh, he will be carrying a suitcase with stickers of Paris, you know, and that the camel will be carrying a container um, from a toy truck. Um, but, um, but also his nose is a dreidel with a hay, the, the Hebrew letter hay, which was the letter that was added to the name Abraham. It's a letter that represents God in, in Hebrew. So this is also an entry point to the story. This is something that there is nonsense, but there is a place that the teacher and the kid or the grandparent or the parent and the kid can look together and then it can, the kid, the parent can tell the story of the hay that was added to Abraham abram's name so so, so Hano, this, this book is like a um a jigsaw puzzle in its own right you can uh, you can look at it and look for clues uh, and what you uh, what you were meaning to do when you added all of these uh, bric-a-bracks and little toys and uh, yeah um totally. we're looking at sarah so, yeah. so yeah, there are two sides to the book that, that can have independent, independent lives. I mean, one, uh, Shira and I came up with those, um, um, those values, those advices, and we, um, we wrote a text together with, with help of a wonderful writer, Naomi Schumann, Schulman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, but the illustrations are my own crazy world in which, um, you, you, you know, for example, we're looking at Sarah, 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 uh, Abraham's wife, and she's laughing. And uh, and actually, her advice is, uh, you know, it's okay to laugh and to giggle when you don't know what to answer, which is uh, what she did when uh, three angels, uh, three visitors, told her she was going to be a mom at eighty-five or how, however old she was um but um you know i had fun putting chattering teeth as her eyes and um and you know making the no you, you know and the three angel the three visitors one is a robot the other one is a waiter <laughs> and the other one is i uh, god knows what he is you know the yellow green one on the right uh, so for, for teachers teaching this in class do you have like a handbook of uh of uh, Hanoch's uh, icons here and uh, 
No, but uh, I would say, um, okay, for starters, the book is given out by a PJ library in uh, mm -hmm. United States. It has been handed out this month uh, to, I, th I think, fourth graders. Uh, I think they handed out like 60,000 books. So the, the, the PJ library version uh, definitely comes with the educational guide. I have to say that over the years, I learned so much from teachers that, um, that, this, that, that taught me how to use uh, my work um, educationally because they send me the projects that they do. Um, and I'll show you, I can show you some uh, soon. Um, okay. We look at <laughs> Hanok, I, this uh, show is also about you and your journey. Yes. So uh, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing the screen for a minute, and everybody is going to uh, is going to run out and buy your book. If you show everybody the book, they're not going to buy it. Um, so I want to get back to the book, but I want to start out with you because in these interviews we also look at the journey of the uh, of the illustrators, authors, the people who actually create this. And uh, um, but before I do so. You are a creator here. Um, are, are you playing God? You know, you're 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 giving these um, these biblical characters faces and personalities. Um, and the word "create" in English is something that humans do, and also God does. Not right. in Hebrew. Not in Hebrew. Right. So, so you're also um, teaching kids that it's okay to to create their own Bible figures. Well, it's okay. You know, I like to say, and um, and this became very, very clear during COVID, but I like to say in general um, uh, to kids, what happened is that during COVID, we were all kids. Kids don't have control over what happens in the big world. Adults, we also don't have control, but we think that we have, you know. Kids don't have control. They feel lost. Everything they're they're small. Everybody else is big. They're power. They feel powerless. Everybody else has much more power. But within the when they're creating art, in their little letter size page or whatever, however big their space in which they create is, they here I'm holding a big a cardboard. They are God. They have all the power in the world. To, to dream, to behave in a different way, to be mean, to, um, to fail also, to, to not to be good kids, not to be, not to be successful, not to do what they're expected to do, uh, to draw guns, to shoot, to kill, you know. I think it's okay to do it within the art space. This is what art is made for, art is a place, is a space that is protected. It's not the real world. So I love that. And, and, and I think that for me, it also allowed me when I was doing caricatures and I was drawing mean pictures of people, I would meet people on the street or I'm, that they didn't know me and they would meet me and they say, but you're so nice. Uh, I imagine you as being a big, nasty man, you know, and, I, and, and but that's, that is exactly the place where when you create, you can be somebody else. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I really like that, that aspect. And, and if this is somehow related to be godlike, I don't know, but it is definitely talks about the the um, um, the, the omni, omni omnipotent power that you have when uh, when you create within okay, your I, creation okay that that's good we'll come back to that um, now take us back to um, to Hanoch, the uh, little boy uh, because you have argued that uh, you're a little boy at heart and I'm not going to argue with you and I also know you um, and um, take us back to that child and uh, your studies and how you, uh, how you discovered this uh, language of yours. I'm going to call it a language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I miss what you said about the little kid, but I, I, you said a word that I couldn't hear very well. You said that the little kid was whatever. Chanoch, the little kid. What were you okay. like, and what, why? Okay. Why are why are you stuck, like many creative people, back in your childhood? Um. Well, uh, I don't know if I'm stuck in my childhood, but I'm definitely. I'm. I almost feel like the same person. Obviously, I am the same person. But uh, but I, you know, I I have feelings that I say, well, those are exactly the same feelings that I had when I was a kid, you know, um, and some obviously not. But, um, but I, you know, I, I think I was an observer. I, I, was, um, I was the little kid in the family. I was uh, physically little, short, uh, always the shortest kid in the class. So I feel that in a way, my drawings my funny drawings, but also something about my behavior was calling for attention, was calling, you know, to be noticed. I always um, identify with, um, in the final scene of Shrek 1, there is the donkey jumping behind, he wants to be seen, you know, so I think that when you're short, you're jumping constantly because you want to be, you want to be seen. Um, so there was an as that aspect, I feel. Uh, metaphorically, of course, I wasn't jumping all the time. Um, and, um, and I guess there is some drawing capacities in my family. Not uh, amazing, but, you know, we were all good in drawing. Um, I was drawing in Uruguay cows, football, soccer players. And then when I, when we I was born in Uruguay when we moved to Israel in the 70s. I was drawing um, fighter airplanes and guns um, and soldiers and, uh, and some soccer players still. How, how old were you when you came? I, I was 11. I was 11 and we settled in Ramad Gan. And I went to a very middle, very proper school. Uh, which you might have heard of Blich Ramad Gan, which is a very, it's a school that, you know, you need to be a good boy. And, you know, uh, at that time, also in the 70s, Israel was a very homogenous society. So I needed to fit in. So I think that um, anything that was a little bit different, like drawing, you know, I sort of put it aside. I studied math. Uh, I ended up with high school degree, uh, diploma with high grades in math and in computer science. Um, and um, I served in the army for five years. And then after I finished the army, I actually um, applied automatically because I had good grades to medical school and to computer science. And I was accepted to both. And, um, and a week before medical school started, I said, you know, why am I doing this? That's not what, you know, that's not what I want to do. So I'm just doing it because, you know, I have good grades and I want to fit in and I want to do what I'm expected to do because I'm a good boy. Where, where, were, you accept, where were you accepted to study medicine? In Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in 1987. Because uh, had you been accepted, in, had, you, had you been accepted in Tel Aviv, I would have been your teacher. You see. Oh, okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. But at the at the last minute, you said this is I not the, I, this is I this is not the Hanoch Piven I know. Well, I mean, I kind of you know, I I, I wasn't that smart. I, I I only somehow I was intuitive. Uh, I was I listened it to my intuition enough to say. Uh, this is not the right <clears throat> for me. And maybe only then, at the age of 22 I or 23, I was strong enough. Um, as a new immigrant, you know, I, I was already strong enough to listen to my own gut. And then uh, I studied for one year um, computer science in Jerusalem. Uh, we have some common friends that studied at that time uh, with me. I didn't know them then, but, uh, you know, which became very prominent in the high-tech uh, industry in, in Israel. But um, after one year there, I said, you know, obviously this is not for me. I'm, I'm bored. And uh, during that year, I said, I, I really want to go back to 
my um, my love of drawing, my love of uh, illustrating caricatures. Um, there, there was um, there was the Eichmann trial, the Eichmann, the, the the other Nazi, the Maniuk trial that year. They caught the Nazi, the Ivan the Maniuk, Ivan the Great, Ivan the Terrible, and um, there was a trial that was being. Um, was open for the public in Jerusalem. And I remember I went to, to listen to the trial and um, it was a sold out. I couldn't get in. But next door to where, the, to where the trial was happening was the Israeli museum. So I went to the museum instead. And thank God there was a sold out. And, and there was an exhibition by um, an Israeli artist that I did not know then called uh, Dudu Gershten. Uh, he was just starting for the first time to do his three-dimensional sculptures. And um, the way that Dudu was talking, the way he was really talking about art in a very inclusive way, it wasn't about, I am an artist and you're not. I know and you don't. I am touched by God and you're not. Which you know, is what I thought, what I've heard before, because I did take classes in art and, 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 and there was always what I felt, you know, I, you, if you don't have something important to say about the world, don't be an artist, you know, all this threatening, um, all this, um, I guess it make you feel small because, you know, you don't immediately find what you have to say about the world you start working and slowly you discover things. And Dudu was talking about playfulness. He was approachable. I mean, I, I just saw a video with him. And then I went back to my apartment and I found out in the, in the, in the phone book his address. And I wrote him a little postcard, a gluia. And I said, I saw your show. I am studying computer science but I want to be an, uh, an illustrator like you. Um, could I come and meet you? And he called me the next day um, to my apartment. There, wasn't, there weren't cell phones there. And he said, come over to the studio. And I went to the studio and, and he really showed me his work and we talked a lot and he gave me advice. And, um, and I have to say, and, you know, and, and I've met Dudu many times since, and, and um, he really opened the door for me in a very deep way. Um, so after that, I couldn't turn back. I just quit. I dropped out of college, you could say. And I applied to Bezalel, to the big art school in Israel. And I was not accepted. I was rejected. I was told, <laughs> you know, well, you don't draw in a... I, I don't know what I was told. It was very difficult to be accepted to, to the... Um, graphic design department, uh, which was the only place you could study illustration uh, in Israel back then. So I was rejected and I, you know, but I was already, my mind was set. So I said, I'm going away. And I had a friend that was, um, was studying dance in Juilliard in New York. And I went to stay with him and I applied to schools in New York. I was accepted to the School of Visual Arts. I got a job first as a mover, then as a waiter, and then the best job. Uh, Hannah, I, you, what, you were a mover? I was a mover, yeah. I, I was for half a year, I moved furniture in New York and drove a truck. And, uh, and then I, uh, I got the best possible job. I got a security job. At, um, at one of the Israeli government uh, delegations in Manhattan. And, um, but my security job was uh, so that I could not guard people. I could only guard an empty space. That meant that uh, when everybody went home, I came to the office and I locked myself in and I spent the night there with the computers, the Xerox machines, the, you know, and, and nobody could get in. And um, so it was the perfect job to do my art school projects. Um, 
And I had the job for four years um, throughout my studies at the School of Visual Arts in New York. And, um, and I know I'm not, I, I still have not answered the question how I started to, to create with objects. I'm getting to no, it well, now. I, no, take your time. This is a lot of fun. Uh, I just, I'm going to just now intervene because there must have been some stage when you told your family who was so happy that you got into medical school and you said, no, I'm going to study computers. And they said, oh, well, studying computers is also a, what they say in Yiddish, um, not so you'll bad. Be, you'll be okay. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you become a furniture mover in New York and you've yeah. lost direction. What did the family say? Yeah, you, you know, I have to thank my my parents. Um, you know, they were they were kind of um, a bit confused and lost uh, with what I was doing. But um, you know, I, I I do have a very supportive uh, family, and and I guess also at that point they trusted me somehow, and um, and um, you know. Again, um, it's a family of immigrants, and um, you, 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 you know they they were happy to be here. Um, you know, I, I, I love my parents, and and I'm very grateful of what they they did. They always uh, were supportive, uh, but but of course, I had my own pressure being uh, in my twenties, and. You know, I had my own set of high expectations um, because I met lots of um, successful people around me um, that, you know, that you know, I obviously it put pressure on me as well. And um, so you also I, wanted to you wanted to jump up and down like the donkey in Shrek. Yeah. And I was determined. I was determined. I, I think. Um, what Israel, what, um, you know, I, I came to Israel at the age 11 and I left Israel at the age of 24. And I came back here 10 years later. So from 11 to 24, I lived here in Israel. And, um, and I think Israel gave me, gave me a lot of chutzpah, a lot of, uh, somehow I came out of the army feeling more confident and, um, you, you know, so when I went to New York, I had the Israeli chutzpah combined. Then I realized with some very strong South American side that was more maybe lyrical, playful. Um, so I, I started the art school. I started drawing illustrations. And uh, lo and behold, I discovered that uh, I suck. I'm not very good <laughs> that, uh, you know, all these years that I was doing other stuff, I did not train my hand. Uh, I had a long way to go. Next to me were kids that were younger than me, but they were masterful with the pencil and masterful with the pen and ink. And all around, I saw people that were much better than me technically. They were not necessarily, they didn't have necessarily a better sense of humor. Maybe they were not, um, you know, maybe I had some better ideas, but when it came to execution, I was really not very good. There was, a, I, I had a better eye and a better head than my hand. My hand was an obstacle in a way I could say. And um, so I, because there was all this pressure to succeed uh, or to to be able to make a living, I said, okay, I'll I'll move out of the illustration and cartooning department to the graphic design department. That's a job. I'll have a studio, and everybody will be will be I'll I'll, I'll be able to make some kind of a living. And doing that really um, liberated me from. Uh, the pressure, the technical pressure. And, um, and I started to, even though I was studying graphic design, typography, composition, I was studying other things that really opened my mind. And I always recommend uh, when I meet art school or, or anybody, but when I go to an art school, I always recommend uh, kids to take as many different classes as possible in different areas 
photography can teach you a lot, typography can teach you a lot. I took a class in playwriting. I took a class in, uh, I don't know, in American history uh, in the 60s, sort of what you teach. Um, and, um, and there, somehow I came to discover um, Eastern European collages, Eastern European posters, and uh, all those Romanians and Polish that were very surrealistic in their creations. And, uh, and they, uh, you know, the most famous one, of course, is Sol Steinberg that was a Romanian born artist that uh, through after some years in Paris came to America. And he's sort of the grandparent, the, the, the founding fa fa father of, um, of a modern American illustration. Uh, everybody knows his New Yorker covers, the New York map, the famous New York map that he made. Um, but um, I started to take uh, cartoon uh, caricature classes again, just as a minor for the fun. And there, one time I I was drawing Saddam Hussein, and I during the first Gulf War, and um, I uh, didn't know how to make his mustache, and uh, I saw a box of matches, and I said, "Okay, I'll use the matches." No, I think is and this true? Is this true? I've heard you say this. Uh, on several yeah. occasions. This is a true story. Uh, you know what? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> who cares? Quite, no, no. I mean, it's who a good cares? Story. I mean, it's a it's, it's a great it's story. A great, great it's story. a great yeah. story. I mean, I I I no, I, I there is a I, obviously those matches were somehow next to my illustration because I I saw them and uh I was living then with a girlfriend that was a heavy smoker. So there were matches all around us. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, that was one segment of it. The other factor was um, I saw this uh, poster for the movie, The Great Dictator, which was the, a very minimalistic uh, poster in which there were no eyes, no, fe no, no features in the face. But you could still tell this is Charlie Chaplin and Adolf Hitler, or Charlie Chaplin portraying an Adolf Hitler-like dictator. Um, and um, so all this came together, the idea that sometimes you don't have to show all the features in order to make somebody recognizable. Sometimes you don't have to draw if you find a way to communicate. And this was a light bulb that 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 really op opened up because I realized that I could hide the idea that I don't draw very well. Because uh, now, why is this? So, so I realized that you know that I can draw by moving objects around the space. Because when you move two objects, you create shapes. You create the shape that the two of them make. You create the shape that is around them. You create the shape that is between them. The negative shape is a shape also. So you are drawing. It's just a different definition of drawing. Drawing is not necessarily making a line. Drawing is creating shapes, defining shapes. Um, so this connects to what we were talking before about kids that, you know, suddenly this system that was developed by me to overcome my own, um, for lack of a better word, shortcomings um, was really um, a tool that eliminated the technique barrier. So in a way, in the same way that I eliminated for myself, I realized that I could eliminate it. I could take it away for other people too. And then everybody with toys, with objects in collage uh, could have the experience of creating art, the experience of telling something. Because the purpose of, uh, in my book, 
the purpose of creating art is really to tell a story, to tell something. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so this is now uh, several decades. You, you're also one of the pioneers of uh, using, a, I would say, a, like a, a, a early kind of artificial, artificial intelligence to develop apps where people can actually try and be Chanukh Piven. Um, and I've, I've, I've tried to be Chanukh Piven. I've taken your, uh, your, uh, your uh, classes. Faces I make, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, I made a self-portrait. And it was um, Do you amazing have somewhere. Okay. It, it, was, it was amazingly terrible. Uh, it says it's got all the elements, you know, it's got Mel the musician and so on, but um, it doesn't have the composition. So uh, actually you're doing something safe because you can teach the whole world to be Hanoch Piven, but the only person who's going to be Hanoch Piven is you. So now I, I well, just, I just, I, I just figured out your secret. It's a, it's, it's a great idea, right? You tell everybody, <laughs> come on and be Hanoch Piven, but you know that nobody's ever going to be you. That's great. Yeah, well, it it, it, it sounds uh, it's it's partly true, I would say, but uh, I would say that um, I and 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 this is something that I tell always: the idea that um, basically this is when I conduct a workshop, I say immediately: this is not mainly an art workshop. This is a communication workshop. Art is only the means that we will use to communicate. To communicate in two ways. To communicate one with the other. We will be creating next to another. One, maybe we'll be creating together. Maybe we will be showing each other our creations. But more important than that, to communicate inwards. Each person will communicate inwards. When you're making something, you, you are in an inner dialogue. And most so, people, yeah. most people will not uh, do, if you bring them a pen, a brush, a pencil, and you tell them draw, they will immediately go to their last failed um, experience, which is in when they were eight, nine, seven, when they drew a person and the leg came out of the head and they realized that they don't know how to draw. They decided that they don't know how to draw and they stopped drawing. And the idea of drawing or of creating art for most people is connected with a with a um, primal experience of failure. So I, once they they do something with objects and they immediately see that, that something happens and they see it, then they have a sense of um, of um, success even if they just create a, a happy face and then they make it sad. But then when you add the idea that objects have meaning, that you can tell something about yourself by representing your mouth with candy or representing it with sour lemon or representing it with nails um, or representing it with, um, with a, a ruler, whatever, once you finish your creation and there is Mel the musician and there is Mel the teacher and there is Mel connected with smells. And uh, so, so you, um, your creation, and, and again, I don't know uh, your experience, you know, I, I, I don't want to undermine your own experience, but um, what I, for the most part, people feel happy with what, what they created Ah, I, I was delighted by the Not, process, and, by, by, by and, the and, fun. And, right, the fun, but also they feel happy, content and satisfied. And I asked them in a funny way, I asked them, do you think, are you happy with your creation? Yeah. And I said, do you think you, your creation, are you happy because your creation could be hanged tomorrow at the Louvre, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art? And they say, no, nah, no. I mean, they always say, yes, of course. But, you know, but they say, no. So why are you happy with it? Because I made it, because it represents me. But most, and what, what it means really in a deeper way, they're happy because it has meaning to them. 
they manage to distill something that is meaningful to them and represent it. And then other people saw it and other people saw them. And going back to being kids, what do we want most of all? We want to be seen, we want to be noticed, we want to be acknowledged. And um, when somebody makes a picture and he shows it, she shows it, and other people say, great. And other people maybe they might recognize, oh, you put the nose because this. So people are seen. So I think this is the really the, 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 the reason why I am in education, why I'm teaching, why I'm why I'm show, uh, uh, um, obviously it is, um, you know, it is the way of, um, of bringing food to the table of my family, but, um, but I cannot even start telling you how happy it, this road makes me. Um, I don't feel like it, it's work necessarily because why, I, why, I, sh why should it be work if you love it so yeah, much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I basically um, help people uh, tell their story and, and feel happy about it and play. And, you know, for some people, this will be the only time they do it. For some other people, they will come back to me later and say, you know, you opened my eye to something. Other people will say, you know, since your workshop, I've been doing it more. You know, I, I took it, you know, so... Um, I, so it's I, a, it's I think a very I, satisfying I, experience. I, I'm a bad example, and I'll tell you why. I'm a bad example because I get to know the the real thing, which is you. So um, you know, I, I I I've been to your classes. I've made all kinds of things. I've used the toothpaste for my mouth, and there's some musical notes for my nose, and I've I've learned your language, but. Um, because I, I, I'm also lucky that Yossi Vardi introduced us and I actually get to know Hanukh Piven, the creator. Um, it, you, 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 um, you know, you, you're much bigger than your art and your art is universal. And, um, and you're one of the people that, that I've met who, who's taken, who's created a language. You know, I, it, 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 it appears simple. You know, you take a, uh, you take a portrait and then you, you mix it together with the things that make up the, you know, the background of the, of the character and you, you create an artwork. So uh, in the meantime, you're teaching everybody to speak the language, but man, you invented the language and um, you're a real mensch and we have to go. I'm going to interview you more and you've given me a great idea, but I'm going to take it off camera because I don't want to share it. Um, and uh, for all the Jewish people watching us, um, we have to go because we have Shavuot. Right, a, right, right. Holiday, we have to go eat cheese. Uh, so, uh, Hanoch, show everybody your wonderful book. Yeah, and maybe, and, and the reason I love uh, Shavuot is because the story of Ruth, which is, yeah. a, it is a story, and, and, and we will say goodbye with Ruth, I guess, because the we'll story... Say Ru of, we'll say uh, Ruth Avor. Yeah, because the story of Ruth is a story of... Uh, of choosing your family, of choosing who you want to be around, of uh, of having the freedom to follow your heart, and and I love that story as well. So uh, thank you, Mel, for being so generous and always. Thank you, not, not I'm, just I'm, today. I, I, I'm really you're a, a gem of a human being. I'm delighted to know you. Keep up this amazing, marvelous work of yours, and I'm going to share my idea off screen. So uh, we have to sum up. There's a holiday here. Got to go. They're knocking at my door. Uh, but we're going to continue. Write another book. We'll do another interview. Or we'll just do another interview. I, my name is Mel Rosenberg, before I forget. And I am the, what am I, the host of the Children's Literature Channel for the New Books Network. And I've been speaking to the miraculous, wonderful Hanoch Piven, who has created a universe of his own. And he is the author, illustrator, and co-author of the new book, Dream often, dream big, dream laugh big. often, and co-written with Shira Hecht Koller and yes. uh, Hanoch. Bless you, my friend. It's been great. Bye bye and uh, happy holidays. Chag Sameach. Take care, Chag my Sameach. friend. Bye. <laughs>